So I'm here with uh, Leif Johnson, who is a China expert. Leif, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Leif. I am not sure that I would call myself an expert. There's, I have certain amount of feelings about expertise. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I am Leif Johnson. I am a I don't know how I would describe myself. I am a translator and currently academic as far as jobs go um, and anarchist, I would describe myself, um, although I'm not sure that I'm very good at it, but I've been trying for a while. So, Well, that that's, sometimes that's the best you can do, so we can forgive you for that. Um, I'm also not a very good anarchist, so, you know uh we can not be good anarchists together uh so i think you should have mentioned this but uh you are an academic doing china studies yeah so and it, it, it's it's a little bit strange for me i'm theoretically going to be in an academic position doing china studies starting later this year um i'm trained i just fin i just did a phd in geography Prior to doing that, I was mostly sort of border studies person. I came into all of this. I was interested in thinking about borders. And I don't know, I've been interested in thinking about borders and migration for a long time. And sort of more recently, about when I started grad school, um, it was kind of a combination of things, wanting to become fluent in Chinese, wanting to um, like recognizing that there was a lot of work being done around the U.S.-Mexico border and, and migration around there, but not a lot of people, particularly on the left, um, thinking very deeply or well about China, or at least that was the impression that I had at the time. And I had some language skills and I said that I figured that maybe I should try and do that um, and sort of at the same time, I was learning for the first time about the ways that internal migration in China works and specifically the way that ways that it's governed, which seemed to me as someone who had spent some time sort of researching U.S.-Mexico uh, border policy and spending time on the border for a little bit, a lot of the sort of objectives that the Chinese state had around uh migration management is what I like to call it. We're really similar to what the US is doing, what the EU is doing, um, what states broadly do when they try and manage uh, mobile populations. So I got inter interested in that and kind of have been working around migration policy in China for uh, several years now, I guess. Well, it's been, it's been like almost a decade. Yeah, yeah. So you you got you got into studying China like a decade ago. Yeah, more or less. It's kind of a little bit ridiculous. I I took language classes in college, uh, which is more than a decade ago at this point. But at the time, I was I was not studying um, like any kind of policy or, or or sort of like cultural stuff. It was it was just language. But I've spent the better part of the last seven seven years focusing on. China and social policy in particular. Right. So you said that like the left didn't really have like a good grasp on China. Do you think that's changed in the past 10 years? I'm going to guess like, well, like a superficial reading of it would say that it hasn't because, you know, we've gotten the rise of like online China stands who think it's somehow socialist. But do you think like, you know, there's places you can go for more nuanced analysis? Um, I think there are some. I, they were mostly around when I um, was first thinking this, and I just didn't know about them. There, there are some outlets that I really like. Um, I think some of the best writing on China from a left or, or radical perspective is Chuang, um, C-H-U-A-N-G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are... I think they. I think they basically just call themselves communists and uh, leave it at that. But um, they do a very good job. There are some other people. Um, Gong Chao, G O N G C H A O, and Made in China, which is a like open access journal. That's it's kind of it's not 
I wouldn't call it radical necessarily, but it's from a more left perspective and it's pretty reliable, I think. And I, I, I think that's some of the better writing. Um, but to answer your question, I think the left or like social movements broadly in, and I'm in the U.S. and I'm speaking primarily from a U.S. context. I think that um, Australia in particular is probably in a different place. I'm interested in what that looks like for you. Um, and I don't know as much about Europe. But at least from my, my experience, the U.S. left doesn't do a lot of thinking about China. Yeah. Which I think is really a shame for, uh, for, a vari- for a variety of reasons. I think part of it is that you don't have to. And um, most of the relationships that exist between the U.S. and China, aside from sort of this new, quote unquote, new Cold War that got kicked up via sort of like liberal-ish campus protest stuff around sort of sweatshop conditions or, uh, or, or, or manufacture, manufacturing con- labor conditions. But it wasn't, it wasn't as pressing and there weren't like direct, there wasn't like U.S. military invention, intervention to think about that people were thinking about at least. And it's a really different situation from like at the time in the sort of mid 2000s when I was getting radicalized myself, like a lot of people were thinking about Latin America and thinking about like Latin American social movements as the kind of models that we could pick up or build solidarity with. But China felt more distant. I think, I think part of that is like a big part of that is language. It's a hard language to learn. Relatively few people learn it. Lots of people learn Spanish. The sort of U.S. immigration policy has something to do with it, like immigrants coming from Mexico and other Latin American countries, Central American countries, work in different, like lower wage industries than a lot of uh, Chinese immigrants. Although that's not universally true, but I, I think all I, I think there's like all of these different factors. But the what it ended up being was a situation where it was relatively easy to not think about China very deeply. I think that's I think I think it's problematic though because it happens to be increasingly at the center of of of, of the global economy, increasingly important to the US economy in 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 in, in particular. I don't know, and people yeah, there, there there is some you know, there was there there was some dis- there has been for a long time discussion about like, you know, shipping jobs overseas, sh- shipping jobs to China, but it didn't really build any kind of uh, kind of connection. So I've, I've felt for a while now that that is a space that could be. It's important to have people doing work in that space, building connections, doing translation, um, and just like building better building better understandings so of the way that things are going on. And I don't know the current sort of wave of tanky apologists or or, or, or whatever is partly a an example of why yeah. better understandings are important because I don't think they have very good understandings. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. So, full disclaimer, I'm not very involved uh with Australian politics, um unfortunately. I should be, but um you know, I have bullshit health problems that prevent me, but I mm-hmm. I I am getting better, so here's hoping that I can eventually get do more. Um but China is, you know, definitely a concern even in like more uh conventional politics uh, australia is like just in a whole bunch of ways much smaller and much weaker than you uni- than the united states uh and we're much closer to china and so you know like we kind of have to be yeah so like a lot of our coal exports go to china um we dodged the uh 08 recession because we were exporting so much coal to china that uh like we made up for it Mm -hmm. so and you know there's like stuff about like um you know shady deals being made and like bribery um and like intellectual property sabotage and all that other stuff that you know that's that's just like you know i will just come across like stories like that in the local news or you know like uh when i talk when i yeah when i like i talk to you know family or friends um you know, like some of them will bring that up. Oh, I'm sure. Absolutely. And also another part is we have like a lot of Chinese immigrants here. 
Like um, when I when I was going to school, for example, like when I was in high school, uh, I I don't know. I'd say like anywhere from ten to twenty percent of my friendship group were like Chinese. Yeah, absolutely. There's a really interesting thing that happened just with this past sort of the coronavirus situation and economic consequences thereof. I have a friend sort of who is an academic in Australia um, who is telling me, and I don't, I, I haven't researched this in depth, but um, currently like the Australian university system, a huge amount of their actual revenue comes from uh, international students, almost all of whom are from China. Um, and there's, there, there have been these kind of really intense movements as th- there are a lot of Chinese students abroad um, in Australia and elsewhere. And when it became clear that the Chinese state was managing, co- managing COVID better than a lot of Western states, a lot of those people were trying to go back. And there was sort of this big push to recall um, mm. people studying abroad. And so according to my friend, at least at his university, and I think in a lot of universities all over Australia, this caused a massive revenue crash. And so they did, like the universities are laid off all of their contingent faculty that they you know, are able to lay off and are making all of the sort of permanent faculty sort of double their, double the amount of work that they're doing to make up for the, what the contingent faculty were doing. Um, it's kind of crazy like that, that link seems super tight in Australia. And I, I, I know that um, like my university in the U S also had some similar issues. Um, but I don't think it was relying on um, foreign students or Chinese foreign students in particular uh, in quite the same way. I think any, any, anyways, it just seems like in general, there's like a much tighter economic and like uh sort of immigrant connection there from my outsider perspective yeah i definitely remember when i was i so i graduated about uh five six years ago and i definitely remember like even back then there was you know like talk of um austerity and raising Mm -hmm. raising prices um and stuff like that uh and yeah i i think that's you know just part of like the broader trend of you know sort of academic cost disease and yeah, yeah, yeah. governments, you know, uh, not funding stuff. Uh, anyway, let's talk about something far more interesting than how much universities suck, um, your time in China. Yeah, I have at this point lived in China for like cumulatively probably three years, um, which is I guess more than three years actually. Which some in in some ways feels like a lot, and also not a lot at the same time, I guess. But yeah, it's it is an interesting place for a ton of reasons. I, I don't I don't know. I could talk I, I could talk about it probably at too much length. So, um, what are you particularly interested in? I think how about we start with just like the the place you lived in, because you know Chi- China is a big place. And, you know, yeah. depending on where you live, that, that matters a lot. So let's start there. Yeah. So because I was researching migration, and I'm not sure that this was, you know, in, in, in retrospect, I'm not sure that this was the best idea, but I have spent most of my time in Shanghai, um, which if I was a person listening to this podcast, I would maybe start doubting myself a little bit because I think that a lot of people who are foreigners who live in Shanghai uh, don't have a very much contact with anything outside of Shanghai. And really, that means anything outside of a small English-speaking bubble. I think my experience is slightly different than that. I lived in Shanghai for a while and started doing research on construction labor, spent most of 2019 working on a construction team installing fiber optic infrastructure and have kind of spent a lot of time in migrant areas in Shanghai and 
generally sort of lower uh, lower income places. I picked Shanghai in particular because there's a it's a huge it's a huge city. It's not as heavily migrant dominated as Pearl River Delta mega cities in uh, Shenzhen or Guangzhou, but it's still I don't know. It's a little bit weird because I don't think that the official numbers are are extremely trustworthy, but they say that it's about 40% of the population is migrants. I think that the number is higher. If you ask anybody who's a long-term sort of migrant worker in Shanghai, they're going to say that's that's crazy. There are so few actual Shanghainese people and the like. migrant population is, is much larger. Um, but I think a lot of that is due to the kind of pretty intense social segregation that exists between uh, migrant workers and locals there. Right. And so was it just Shanghai? Did you visit anywhere else in China? I've visited a ton of different places. I've been in South China, mostly Shenzhen. I've been in Beijing quite a bit. I've been in more on sort of, I ha- haven't, haven't lived in, but have spent time in uh, quite a few different places in Anhui, which is uh, where a lot of the folks I worked with were migrating from primarily that that's primarily like Anhui and Jiangsu provinces. Um, and then, sp- and then sp- spent a little bit of time in like Western China in, in Sichuan. I haven't spent, I haven't gone to Xinjiang or Tibet primarily because I didn't want to deal with all of the state stuff that would be necessary to do that. And I kind of didn't feel like I, there, there was any way to, for me to do that without like, except as a tourist, which doesn't feel, doesn't feel very good to go to that, those places in that context. Yeah. But I would say, I would say that I have pretty good, a, a reasonably broad um, experience. I've, I, I spent a bunch of time, I guess I also spent a bunch of time in the other cities around the Yangtze River Delta, around Shanghai and Hangzhou and, and Suzhou and a couple a couple other places there, Wuxi. And while you were there, were you just doing academic work or did you ever, did you get like, ever get a job outside of that? I was primarily doing academic work. There was a there was a while um, when I kind of ran out of money and um, did the thing that a lot of foreigners or expats or whatever did, and I taught for like in this case not an English training training center, but a center that was doing all of these sort of like English language Hong Kong curriculum based sort of extra coursework for kids in middle and high school so like taught u.s history taught world history stuff like that that that's a weird situation because it's a totally different social class it's like the place that i was going to was more in more in downtown in a place where i definitely couldn't afford to live myself and it was pretty obvious i they did they didn't tell us how much uh, people were paying per class, but we were being paid quite well. All of the other sort of foreign tutors, we were being paid quite well, but it became pretty clear after from talking to other people who'd been there longer that all of the students were paying basically like our hourly wages were the same as like the hourly costs per student. Um, and we didn't have super large classes, but, um, they were making a ton of money on that, um, and all of the all of the, all of the kids were uh, the children of very wealthy people, which ends up kind of being how I'm not sure about I, I'm not sure about other schools, but I think there's this entire economy that is doing that, and then there are all of these basically like the schools have to recruit people. The, recruit the children of people who are higher high up enough on the hierarchy that the parents have a vested interest in protecting the school's sort of illicit illicit operation because they're all hiring like none of 
in the in the tier that I was working at, none of them are going through uh, form the sort of stringent and difficult formal hiring processes that are necessary to hire to hire foreigners. But at the same time, there's this massive demand for foreigners to teach uh, to teach English. So basically, I think what ends up happening is that like there is a level of political protection afforded by the fact that anybody who's high up in the government wants their kids to learn English from from foreigners, basically. I, I don't think it's like extremely high up. I think the extremely high up people are either sending their kids sending their kids abroad directly or go, or sending them to more effectively accredited schools. But those cost, um, you know, those cost way more. So um, there and there are plenty of people in the in government positions who don't have the sal the, the salaries are actually pretty low. Um, the formal salary that you can get, the money that you actually make is through sort of various forms of graft. Yeah. Wow. Did you ever like talk to your students like in any depth or some, not a ton. It was kind of, it was kind of really discouraged. They had this pretty stringent curriculum. A lot of the kids weren't very interested um, in talking about very much. Some, I had, I had a couple of classes where I was teaching like, later like middle school kids who wanted to talk quite a bit and they were all kind of really interesting it, it, it felt they felt very sheltered to me like kind of young wealthy sheltered people they all had quite good english um they all were i don't know if they were all planning on going to college abroad but they were mostly planning on that had some really weird conversations about politics taught like was teaching basic history about World War II and a bunch of my students were like, I had this kind of cohort of younger male students who were all kind of, I don't know, a little bit aggro, kind of really cocky. And um, they were all going off. Well, yeah, we know all about World War II. We know all about Hitler. You know, who's great Hitler really into Hitler. Um, he was great at leading his country and sort of had to go veer off and be like, okay, do you know what genocide is? Let's talk about genocide for a little bit and like why it might be a bad idea. But it, no, it was, it, it, it was interesting. It was kind of difficult to have any real or like effective social, social interactions in those circumstances. I think I was also kind of like, I think if I had felt more stable, I would have done that, but I was relatively short term employed and kind of really wanted to keep the job and was like, I'm not going to rock the boat too much. Aside from, I'm definitely going to tell these kids about genocides um, and why we shouldn't do them. But yeah, but it was, a, it's, it's a totally different world. I don't know. I mean, I think like any big city, it is a, my experience of Shanghai was at, as, as a place that's like a collection of very different cities that are inhabited and experienced in very different ways. You know, there's like an entire infrastructure for expats and um, foreigners, several infrastructures really, because there's people who are existing at like really different parts of the wage scale. There's all the like English teachers and folks who are sort of tenuously employed and students and are relatively young. And then there's, it being Shanghai and they're trying to positioning it as a financial center. Um, there's a bunch of like corporate folks who are mostly living in mansions sort of furnished by their employers and have drivers and have chefs and don't really have to interact with anything. But then of course, like all of this being like the foreign side, and then there's all of these different worlds, like being Shanghainese is really different from being a migrant um, there's significant social class differences among local pop like the local population. And then there's like a similarly really massive differences in experience and like what the city is for people who are migrants doing low wage labor and people who are migrants, maybe college graduates working in blue collar or in white collar sort of like 
import export or any kind of like just corporate like regular sort of corporate job and then there's like people who have moved to shanghai but are working for foreign companies are like experiencing a different thing again and they don't in in a lot of cases i think that the, I, I mean this is true for this is true for other other cities too of course but like those groups don't interact often or there are not that many um not not that many opportunities for it so in 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 that sense i was actually really happy to do that um that teaching job because it put me in contact with a bunch of people who i would never like my research i wasn't very interested in wealthy shanghainese folks but it put me in contact with people who i wouldn't have seen otherwise wouldn't have been able to talk to yeah so so what did your research actually consist of then broadly speaking i do ethnographic stuff and i won't bore you with the like the technical academic bits my training is in basically like critical human geography political geography i'm interested in gender masculinity um migration etc a, a bunch of the theory stuff that i work with is all like affect mostly because that's kind of what's current or what a lot of critical human geographers in my department right now and in sort of other departments in the US are working with um and i just kind of went with that but what i was really interested in was the ways that social boundaries are structured outside of the law so what exists in shanghai and other chinese mega cities i guess so ex- exists all across china at this point but is getting eroded except in mega cities is this sort of what's called huko household registration system the way that this works is basically when you're born you are registered with the local government whether that's with your like local town um your village your small city large city in which case you have a like district or whatever this is it's it's a legacy of the sort of socialist period it's existed prior to the socialist period as but mo- but more as a sort of like census type thing states being states wanting to um know how many people exist in each in each polity keeping this sort of like ongoing record of births and deaths etc but during the socialist period what happened was the state said well not only do we need census data we actually need strong managerial structures in order to implement central planning and sort of immediately post revolution um there was this big sort of you know revolutionary ferment as you have and um part of that was a lot of peasants moved to coastal cities um moved to shanghai because they said yep well we're free now right we had a revolution so i'm going to move to shanghai um where there's you know work and whatever and i don't have to worry about the japanese i don't have to worry about um you know warlords or whatever we have this one sort of national structure now um and the central government as well as governments of the cities that were receiving large amount large amount of migrants basically said this is horrible this is capitalism these people are all trying to do you know they're they're living their lives by a market logic rather than by the logic of the plan um we don't want to let this continue to ha- we don't want this to happen because it actually messes with our ability to do central planning because all of the all of the tallies of who lives where are all going to be messed up basically the stru- basically the from the perspective of the central government as well as the local governments migration makes it difficult or impossible to keep accurate counts of how many people are living in any any given place and as a result it makes it hard to make a plan about how many like just at the level of goods like what you can expect some place to produce and what you need to send to that place in terms of uh goods produced elsewhere right there's also this additional issue 
I did a bunch of archival research kind of early in my research period. I was in the Shanghai Municipal Archives looking up uh, just the history of const migrant construction labor in the 50s. And there was a bunch of really interesting stuff where it actually caused migration actually led to really intense difficulties with labor management under the sort of at that time relatively new uh, socialist management system. Um, basically what what you had was a bunch of sort of mid-level managers of the Shanghai Construction Bureau or the um, various state-owned state -owned corporations that had been sort of set up to manage various forms of construction in Shanghai, all writing memos to each other complaining about how all of these migrants had come from somewhere else and they were, you know, working under a obviously bad and anti-socialist capitalist system and they were earning higher wages than the socialist system was able to pay to construction workers on the official formal work teams. Um, so they were having all of these issues with both strikes and just like labor desertion where formal construction workers were leaving to work for to work for bosses um, because the bosses would at least pay them better than the pay them better than the state was paying at the time this was ultimately managed by curtailing immigration um, the soviet union had a similar structure i don't know russian it's called propishka i think is how you pronounce it but like everything I've read about that indicates it's referred to as an internal passport. Um, but everything that I've read about that indicates that it was ultimately not all that functional in controlling migration for most of the history of the Soviet Union. Um, the Chinese system, on the other hand, was very functional and sort of like apart from the chaos around the famine and the cultural revolution it meant that between the sort of like late 50s uh, through the late 70s, there was effectively no internal migration, like unplanned internal migration within China. What would happen was the central government would allocate groups of workers to move to different places or um, individuals to work as technical advisors in, in different places. But like by and large, you couldn't move. This was more or less accomplished by your grain ration being, or in urban areas, um, being given out according to your local, to your household registration. So the structure was that um, peasants had to produce their own food and then also produce uh, grain as taxes, um, which were then sent to cities to sort of um, fuel the jump-starting of a industrial economy um, and then all of those industrial goods would then be sent back to sent back to the countryside so if you are a rural person um, and you leave you leave your hometown to go to a city um, you actually can't eat in the city because there isn't a market um, for you to buy food and your ability to receive food is more or less uh, conditioned upon having this registration card so, like, ultimately, there's not much unplanned migration until the reform and, and opening up um, when basically, like, market sales begin to be at least partially tolerated. And so people would mostly what that looked like early on was farmers uh, taking extra grain that they had and going to the city and selling it in sort of like roadside stands. Yep. Um, gradually, that escalated to the situation we're in today where it really depends on what kind of like number you look at but the internal migrant population of rural urban migrants is almost 200 million the total like mobile population which is referred to like the the the, the state's official word for this is floating population the people who are outside their sort of place where they're supposed to be Pop, that population is something like 250 million people at this point. The household registration system, generally speaking, has slacked off, has been loosened 
Um, everyone is still registered, but since the reform period, they've been opening things up first with just the opening of markets, but later they abolished the distinction because pre- previously it w- it was like explicitly on your registration, whether you're a rural or urban household. If you're urban, you get a grain ration. If you're rural, you have to produce, right? That distinction was formally abolished actually somewhat recently. Um, and they're sort of abolishing now, only now, restrictions on transfer of residents, uh, like transfer of registration to small and medium sized cities, which is kind of a little bit of a, it's less of a big deal than any news outlet that you read about this will um, make out because those cities were already sort of competing to attract migrants. Um, However, all of the big metropolises, which have dramatically higher wages, also correspondingly higher migrant populations than small cities, all are like more or less raising the barrier to to entry um, and sort of maintaining restrictions on migrants, like more or less like social rights guaranteed by the state if you um, if, if, if you move there Previous, at some points it's been illegal to like own property to buy housing if you don't have res- a residence permit and they have moved that back and forth in different uh, different cities at different times the main one at this point is that the college entr- entrance admini- exam is administered differently in different localities. The education is specific to that locality's entrance exam. And so as a result, you have to take the entrance exam in the place where you're registered. So it's really difficult to, it's kind of that kind of service, right? It's like education or healthcare. There's a lot around pensions. A lot of migrants pay into pensions, but then can't make use of that pen, those pension funds that they pay that they paid into they're trying to make these portable but it's this massive bureaucratic process to kind of free up free up all of this money that you've been contributing and if you've worked in like 10 different places like a lot of people do um, or if you're working informally and you're not sure if your boss is paying into the pension system or not mostly you can't get that money and what ends up happening a lot like the US I, I should say is that low-income migrants subsidize the pension and retirement and medical systems yep. that are ultimately destined for citizens, like formal citizens. So that's kind of the current state. Like currently it is formally, le- it's legal to migrate. It's legal to move. In a lot of cities you can get, um, I think I think everywhere at this point, it's kind of, it's only been in the last less than 20 years that this that this has existed but you can now get a temporary residence permit in most places which gives you the legal right to reside in um in a, in a city where you're not registered and it gives you some rights but basically the rights that it gives you are anything that, that doesn't actually cost the government money um so it doesn't really give you a- access to ed- education or any health care that the government would subsidize or anything like that yeah, this stuff you were saying about wanting to, you know, have control over populations so they can be managed yeah. feels like, you know, an unpublished chapter of seeing like a state. No, absolutely. It's a it it and it, it it's kind of massive the way that the state had to do that. And you can see this in you know, the Chinese the Chinese state wanted to see mobile populations for a specific reason, right? Like in in terms of managing production and consumption, the U.S. state wants to do the same thing. And it's just uh, justified slightly differently when we talk about like all of the sort of right-wing fear. I mean, aside from being just just simple racism, a lot of the internal justification for right-wing fear of immigrants is that these people are not visible to the state, right? And therefore, and, and so they're criminals, right? Or probably we don't know. How do we know? So it's really interesting, and 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 I, th- I think it speaks to a lot of the problems of 
centralized socialist government, like any kind of any kind of systematized what, like cybernetic thing or whatever you're trying to build. The thing is, it's either going to have to immobilize the population or it's going to have to deal with yep. movement of people, which is, you know, random, stochastic, variable um, changes at different times, unpredictable. Um, it just like adds a massive degree of complexity to any kind of planning uh, planning program. And I think the, Ch- the way that the Chinese state cracked down on that is a really important historic piece. I also think, I also just think that the, like the, the, the labor management part, I really want to go back when I go back later this year, I'm going to try and get back into the archives and do something where I can actually, that I can actually publish with all of this archival material around like labor struggle, because it's really interesting that the state was unable to pay, you know, like the state says, we don't want these workers to be exploited by by the boss, who's obviously making a profit off of their labor, um, whereas we are not making a profit off, off of their labor. We are good. good. And it, this is all like in the documents. It's all very, you know, good socialists writing to other good socialists about how we need to abolish wage labor. And there's all of this illicit wage labor happening, and it's a big problem. Meanwhile, all of their workers are on strike because they're not paying them as much as they could earn via wage labor. And like, I am not a person who loves wage labor very much, but like, I have a lot of respect for these workers um, going on strike and, and leaving um, to go to go work for somebody else and, and, and make more money. And also, you know, respect for the, I think the only real the only only real sort of not saving grace but like positive part they do say a lot like you know nobody is managing these these illicit constructions and they're not up to standard they're not up up to code right um so i think that there's a i think i think that like the sort of regulatory state function is kind of important um to make that kind of thing work or like yeah. at least have something to replace the regulatory state function, which didn't exist at the time. And there's, you know, all of this documentation of, yeah. you know, people yeah. saying, well, this thing, this project collapsed and the evil yeah. capitalist exploiters who were exploiting their workers killed workers. Right. Which is obviously bad, not, not supported, but like at the same time, it's like clear that the, centralized construction stru- construction system was not functional what ended up happening basically was that they ended up decentralizing the effectively decentralizing the construction system to where there are still state owned construction companies but they don't actually do any building they're all centralized general contractors they hire you know they'll they'll hire architects and do sort of code inspection but really what they're doing is managing yeah, 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 managing yeah, yeah. financial projects yep. and then the actual labor is sub 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 contracted to the extent where a lot of like the workers almost never know who's actually in charge of the site that they're that they're working on and they don't have any relationship um, beyond their individual boss and that is an informal non-contractual sort of like just piece of yeah informal labor and that's kind of that's kind of been the been the case actually since prior pretty much since the reform period some of the construction was decentralized prior to the reform period but it was like forced to hire local workers more or less you only started to get migration into construction um after that but it, it, it ends up being this really difficult thing because like if you're somebody who wants to build something or if you're somebody who wants to um you know add on to your house or repair the steps or or whatever kind of construction project that you have if you have to go through the like the local state to do it you kind of end up in it doesn't really work it doesn't really get done so like at least in this period in the early in the in the in the fifties, there really was this like flourishing sort of informal economy for building stuff and it was you know and even a lot of the even a lot of those cases were like 
you know, I'm a state-owned factory and I want to build another like wing on my state-owned factory, but like the state-owned construction company is taking forever and I don't have good pull. And so I'm just going to hire these people, you know, and it's not like a capitalist, necessarily a fully capitalist economy existing alongside the sort of state run thing. A lot of it is just like really mixed in. Yeah. 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 No, it definitely, again, going back to seeing like a state. Yeah. Scott makes the point at the very end about how like these, you know, in these like system in these like ordered systems ordered rational systems there are these like quote unquote anomalies that seem weird but when you know you zoom out a little and you actually take in the entire system they suddenly it suddenly becomes clear that like they're actually essential to the entire system and what you're describing right it would totally collapse yeah yep. what you're describing here you know it just seems like it could have come straight out of his book um which I, I think is like, you know, I think that's a really, I think all of this is like a really good argument that Scott is really onto something. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if like we can just like pick an example like this and like, it, you know, it's really well described. Yeah. Actually, so this brings me to another thing. So how much do you think, because like from what I can tell, it seems like a lot of, it seems like there was like a lot of sort of like bottom up pressure or like a lot of bottom-up activity that just sort of made the reforms like it wasn't some like neoliberal top-down social engineering from what you're describing it seems more like the chinese like it was just like well this stuff's happening so let's like you know just try to formalize it and like bring it into our system as opposed to having it be this like informal thing um do you have like any evidence of that in like the archives that you've delved into um not a ton well so i think in terms of the like in terms of the 50s and this is a part where i'm not i i I have i have this kind of specific historical knowledge because this is what what i did what i did the archival research on part of why i haven't written on it is because i feel like i need more uh i need a better understanding of the broad uh structure that's going on i think there at least for the constru- the case of the construction industry in Shanghai in the 50s, kind of what happened was the state cracked down on the, the sort of external, the uh, cracked down on the anomaly. Things didn't work very well. And there was like, ended up being a de facto decentralization, um, but they just ceased to use migrant labor so much because they're wasn't migrant labor to to use right because at this at the level of broad policy uh people's mobility was curtailed and people were sent back to their places where they were quote unquote supposed to be so for like that sort of however you want to call it socialist period i think that a lot of the sort of like migrant labor patches that were happening early on didn't really happen i do think that after at, at least in that industry i don't remember these pieces very closely but i was trying to read the people i mentioned earlier chuang um they publish like a journal and blog and i read a lot of their blog stuff but they have like an economic history of china sort of and um they talk they, they talk a lot about and i think the one of the in one of the first parts of that um they talk about I don't, I don't remember where it's at actually. Um, but they, 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 they talk, they talk at some points about the various ways that sort of bottom up organizing ends up being brought into the sort of formal functioning of, of, of the state. There have been particularly in terms of like urban or, or particularly in terms of rural, uh, structures, not urban, sorry. I think there was a lot of different experimentation as they tried, uh, to, tried to make things work, whether it was like communizing everything or then allowing what they called TVEs, like township and village enterprises were allowed for a while where um, the, like a specific township would be allowed to sort of from the bottom up more or less, or, or, or at least at the level of like the local state decide to put capital towards making a specific product that they could then sell to the rest of the country so there's a, there, there, there's kind of a lot of history of 
different types of experiments, some of which got rolled into the formal structure and some of which didn't. Um, but I'm not as familiar with all of that history that I could like lay it all out. What I know, like what did happen was in the reform period, there's a kind of, and it's partly based on all of, all of these experiments, like basically as markets begin to be allowed, um, sort of the first people to come in end up being like from Hong Kong or Taiwan. And there are these like capitalists who build up various kinds of industry from, in some cases from scratch and in some cases building on sort of existing, existing structures. And those really kind of explode. And this is, the, this is where you see the, you know, all of these like double digit economic growth and, and basically what's been going on for the past at least 30 years, 30, 40 years of like massive rapid um, expansion, expansion and change in the, in the Chinese economy. Um, and a lot of that, while a lot of the like early capital was, was coming from abroad, there was a ton of like, I think local experimentation wasn't kind of continues to be um, local experimentation in terms of like pushing rules and um, figuring out new, new ways to do stuff. I think where things are at now, it's more of the state is un, un, under Xi Jinping is pretty strongly trying to build state capacity to manage, to effectively manage all of this like market explosion that has been going on in a variety of different ways. Um, not to say that it, that, that things that things haven't been managed all the all, all the all the way, um, but in a lot of cases that management has been like heavy-handed or has, fun has functioned in a, in a bunch of different ways, not necessarily like at the direct control of the of the central government. And I, th I think what's happening now is more work towards building a stronger state that can that that, that can actually see all of this stuff. Do you know like why we're seeing this change? My general guess would be like because I know like the economy in China is like this mess of like state owned and private stuff, but then you know of course like there's all this corruption going on in like the private sector for like anything beyond a certain scale. Like you basically need to know someone in the Communist Party to make it happen. Um, and so my my naive uh, my naive assumption about what's going on would be like we've reached this point where you know people in like the government are basically people no people with power sorry are basically like it's starting to engage in more sort of zero sum ways right my assumption would be because you know the prior economic growth was sort of driven by applying stuff that was sort of already figured out whereas like now that you actually have to do proper like now that you're on sort of on like the frontiers of various technologies that's a lot harder yeah and so like graft zero-sum graft just just is like a lot easier yeah yeah am i am i roughly in the right area i think partly um i think i think th i think there are a bunch of different things one of them is that there's actually like structural issues in the economy that are kind of forcing a change like one of the reasons why i think that studying migration in china is so important is that i think that the manufacturing like the structure of china as a manufacturing powerhouse could not have been sustained as long as it has been without the ex without the continued functionality of this hukou system and like migration management I don't, I, sorry, your question is really good. And there's like five different directions that I want to go. Um, I think this one, I think, I think, I think this one's kind of important. And then I want to talk about IP. I want to talk about intellectual property, but so basically what happened is that, and like the U S knows this also, and I, I want to, for anybody listening in the U S or in Europe or anywhere else, you know, it's important to recognize that this is also happening in our own context, but the economy is what is is partly held up by the fact that you have a functionally what like all all of these chinese migration scholars call a dual labor market on one hand you have the migrant labor market and on the other hand you have the local labor market and the two are divided by formal and informal citizenship structures and like what that means is that you can pay migrants much less 
um, and you will continue to be able to pay migrants much less than you pay citizens because all of these various structures like prevent people from organizing, allow you to do deportation um, if people organize, which is something that existed in China until until the late 90s. They construct sort of like internalized ideas about otherness among people who are migrant immigrating, right? Like I'm not from here, I'm from somewhere else, I'm going to return to somewhere else. And this is like a little bit Marxist, but, and I'm not, I don't know, I'm not all that Marxist, but I am in this way. Um, Like the cost of reproduction of labor is way low in rural areas. And so what you have by like having this migration management scheme is the cost of reproduction of your like factory labor or construction labor, or at this point also service labor and all kinds of other like low wage work in urban China. Um, All of that cost of reproduction of labor is externalized to the rural areas. So urban areas are getting the benefit of like, you know, taxation and all of these people working at low wages and contributing to social security funds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all of the education, healthcare, elder care, child care, all of this stuff is assumed to be happening in the, in the rural areas. And so people, you can also pay, pay people a wage that will sustain that sort of like low cost child care, elder care, elder care, et cetera, in rural areas. It would not sustain someone living permanently in Shanghai or in Guangzhou or in Beijing or even in a lot of sort of like smaller urban areas. So the wages, the way that the wage structure, um, wages are basically structured by this, this migration management system. And the result of that is that China has, was able to keep manufacturing wages low for a really long time and capital poured in to invest in all of this, um, all of this manufacturing and didn't immediately jump out. The other, the other side of it is that, Worker organizing was viciously suppressed, and anybody trying to organize for higher wages, in some cases, the state will force an employer to pay workers that they stole stole money from, or or, or whatever. But any kind of like broad, independent, non-state run labor movement is functionally repressed and has been. That hasn't stopped people from organizing, both in like formal ways, often with sort of support from various corners or in just informal ways. There's a lot of stories in the construction industry. What people do is like the boss won't pay them. Mostly this is because somebody above the boss didn't pay the boss and the boss actually doesn't have enough money, but the boss obviously has more money than the workers who have almost nothing. And so the workers will kidnap the boss, strip him naked, take him to an ATM and say like, get out your money, get out, like hit the limit, give the money to all of us and we'll let you go. And like in a lot of cases, the cops kind of let that happen. So, and, and, and that has pushed wages up, right? Like wages have, ridden, have risen significantly in the past 20 years, but they rose slower than they would have had all of these people who moved to um, urban areas been, been able to actually settle down and raise their children and sort of like come to live urban lives where they want more stuff. Or I imagine just like have, you know, better negotiating power if they want to return to rural areas. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And there's still stuff going on, even at this point, like, because a lot of people are, this is like more just construction stuff, but there there, there was a big bunch of protests um, a couple of years ago in Shenzhen, where all of these people who were drilling like the subway tunnels, they're drilling through granite. It's like all granite bedrock that they're drilling through and they don't have adequate, adequate PPE. And so they all got silicosis and they're all dying horrible deaths of black lung, but they're doing that in their hometowns. They're all retired and they want to get, you know, wanted to get money from Shenzhen. The thing, the thing is, it's, it's, it's interesting because it is a communist country, quote unquote, it has like the, the letter of the law is actually very good for workers. And so they say, right, like, you know, we want our compensation for, for workplace inju- injury as laid out by these laws, which say that we should be comp- compensated. But the structure is that they were working without a labor contract. And the state says, well, you don't have a labor contract. I don't know who you are. You're not visible to me. 
Um, we can't do anything according to the law. And I, I think sort of the first wave, they, they tried to placate a bunch of people and they gave them money. And then they realized that there were a lot more people who got silicosis digging subways and foundations in Shenzhen than they thought. And they just beat the shit out of everybody um, and sent them, sent them home. So like, yeah, the migrant status in that case explicitly means that you don't have no negotiating power because you're not, you don't have legal standing. You're not a resident of the like government, you know, the government's like my, the, the local government says, my job is to work for the people of Shenzhen. You're not a Shenzhen person. You don't have a labor contract. Go talk to your own local government about your silicosis, right? And the, your own local government is this rural government where um, nothing has happened. You know, they don't have any money. They don't have any income. They don't have any taxes because everybody's been leaving to go and work elsewhere. So, yeah, so that, that that's one part of the structure. Manufacturing is actually like the manufacturing as a percentage of like as a percentage of GDP and as a per percentage of workers has been dropping in China. Um, and a lot of the especially like lower end manufacturing work is all moving elsewhere because like wages have finally risen to the point where it's cheaper to move those fact move, move those factories elsewhere. So that's one part is like it was delayed for a long time, but the sort of way that capital wants to move to places with low wages is finally happening to China. And so I think the state is sees that as a as a, as a problem. The other side is like like you were saying, there there's this effort to like move up the up the value chain, and a lot of the stuff that already happened was relatively easy. This is kind of speculative. I kind of want to write something about this eventually, but so you, you, do you have a sense of like import substitution industrialization? Ah, uh, this like whole history and theory. I should. Um... But no, and how 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 about you explain it? Okay, both for my sake and also the listeners. Yeah, so this is me being a Latin American studies person prior to being a China person, but there was, and I'm not sure what the specific. I don't I don't remember at this point what the specific timing for all of this was, but there were a whole ver a whole series of theories about development and underdevelopment that ro rose up with people like like often from theorists in Latin American countries in the say starting in the 60s and some of these you get people who are explicitly anti-development but like a lot of what countries were trying to do was think about the, think about themselves in relation to um, and think about develop so the idea, the idea is like you want to think about development not as a linear path where like you start out with rocks and sticks and then you are building semiconductors when you reach the end, kind of like a civ game or something. Yeah, it's it's not civilization. Right. But you 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 instead you think about it as this is partly some of the coming from this is like linked to some of the people doing like world systems theory stuff, Emmanuel Wallerstein, all these people, whatever. Um, but what a bunch of governments in Latin America tried in the 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe I, I might be getting this time period wrong. Don't hold me to it. I'm sorry. It's been a long time since I learned all this. I haven't thought about it for a while, but um, or I haven't done explicit research for a while. But um, what they tried was they said, okay, so what we're doing is we're sending raw materials abroad to mostly the United States. We're doing a colonial kind of thing where the United States extracts raw materials, pays us th for the raw materials, and then we pay the United that money back to the United States to buy, you know, televisions, uh, radios, whatever, manufactured goods. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kickstart our industrial economy by choosing specific things and building capacity to build that thing and substitute for the import, right? So we have the raw materials and we're going to build toasters or TVs or whatever. And um, ultimately this failed to cause massive rapid development in Latin American countries in part because all of the machinery that they needed to build the toasters, TVs, cars, etc. Uh, was produced in the U.S. And so they were just buying that instead of buying the finished product, right? And the, the sort of structural relationship 
rem- remained relatively similar. Um, didn't change. Sorry? It didn't change. Yeah. So this is like, this is a, a profoundly hot take, but um, I think that one reason why China was able to do what they did and like by all accounts sort of succeed in industrializing and reaching sort of this uh, forefront of, of high tech production was because they did that, but they totally disregarded intellectual property law. <laughs> they just they they just did uh, import substitution industrialization. They you know and then and a lot of you know they were the idea originally in like Argentina, Chile, in these places was that they were going to sell to the domestic market, and the Chinese state didn't really do that. Partly because they were like, well, we don't have that much domestic market, and we um, don't really want to develop one either. We're just going to sell exports. Um, but they moved up the value chain really quickly by stealing IP both legally and illegally. And basically, large capital let them do it because at the time they were the largest sort of non, like formally non capitalist, non capitalized space where these large capitalists could uh, develop a, a new, cheap industrial proletariat. I got interested in this, like reading interviews a year or so ago with all of these big uh, people working for companies whose IP had been stolen from China in, in like senior managerial roles. And they basically said, look, this is like a calculation. It's more valuable to us to produce in China than it is to enforce IP. Where would I find these interviews? Because that's really interesting. Um... I don't remember. I'm sorry. I would have to find that. I would. I would have to find that afterwards. I'm. I'm going to write something about this eventually because I think this is super, super interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah. If you could just, if you can just like link it to me so I can put it in the show notes. Yeah. I'll try. I'll try. I'll try and find that after we after we're done recording. Um. But anyway, so it's 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 this situation where like it's really interesting because. The U.S. and you know the, the the World Trade Organization and everybody has been complaining f- mightily for forever about China stealing IP, but nothing has really been done about it. And you you compare that to like what Monsanto does to anybody who plants GMO corn in, anywhere in Latin America, and you know the response is quite different. And I think that partly it was like the Chinese state was able to do some savvy things and whether or not this was like the result of explicit choice on their part or the result of sort of like a serendipitous uh, alignment of coincidence. Um, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, an emer- any kind of emergent thing. I don't really know, but ended up in this situation where they are able to say, look, like if you're going to, in, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, this is, this is, this is really explicit, right? So we can talk about like electric cars. Um, the automobile market in china is relatively new and um the way that it is structured china had a like decently sized quite i guess relatively comparatively small and comparatively low quality automotive industry they said you can build a factory in china if you're ford if you're vw if you're a global like global car manufacturer you can only build a factory in China if if it's a collaboration with one of our state-owned enterprises. And Ford basically said, we have to do this, right? Like we can't miss out on this market. BMW is going to build their factory and everybody else. Um, so all of these companies built their factories in China. And when you when you, when you see the cars, they say, you know, uh, I don't remember that. I don't remember all of them, but let's it's like. The badge on the back says, you know, XX state-owned company is the company that produced that Ford automobile. And what's functionally happening is that these, uh, is that global automobile manufacturers are bootstrapping the production capacity of building high-quality cars in China. Only, like, only specific, like, there, there, there are specific companies that were able to maneuver sort of more sweetheart deals or they got their deals early. Um, I think Tesla doesn't have a 
a local partner. But what what ended up happening is, you know, formal or informal, this is like a functional technology transfer where all of these car companies are are training up a, you know, workers management structure specific stuff and i'm sure and i'm I'm sure that they're they're very very careful about specific parts of their ip but the broad technological question of how to build a car changed dramatically in china between the 90s and now with 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 all of these like collaborative factory constructions Um, and now they're they're at a point where chinese companies are making all of these electric cars and they're kind of leading the market at least in china but it's it's but it's really interesting like all the cars are like explicit they 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 look dramatic they look like clones you you you're like oh this is this car has actually not very much the, the design is pretty explicitly cloned from tesla or cloned from from somebody else um but all of the sort of like basic stuff how to how to how to put together all of the all all of the production lines and the the management structures et cetera et cetera like ends up being imported and you know, you can imagine being a Ford executive and watching VW executives sign a deal and saying, "Well, you know, our option is to not teach our Chinese competitors how to make our cars, or to sell this massive amount of cars to the like rapidly growing Chinese autom- automobile market." I can't actually pass up this um, this opportunity, and that's you know that's just like one one in one industry. But I think you're right that it is pretty difficult to build something up. Like once you've caught up, it's difficult to figure out how to put your, put yourself in a position where you're where you're actually like innovating. There is quite there 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 is quite a bit of inno- innovation happening. Well, there's I mean honestly like actually like to go even a little bit further on that. I think a significant part of the Great Firewall is like an ideological protection device, right? To keep foreign media from infiltrating, you know, the, 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 the Chinese consci- consciousness, quote unquote. But on the other hand, what it does is it allowed Chinese internet companies to exist, right? Like if you think, of, if you think about social media pl- platforms, like most of them are from Silicon, Silicon Valley and like Facebook is global, Twitter is global. There are not very many companies that are not very many countries that have their own infrastructure that creates social media platforms or, 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 or like internet companies. Deliveroo is like in a ton of com- countries. Uber is all over the place. Yep. You know, there's, there's not like a, a, a different one for each country. China was able to build up their own infrastructure of, you know, search, ride hailing, platform companies, et cetera, et cetera by keeping foreign companies out and essentially having a bunch of startups copy western models badly but be the only only thing in the marketplace um there's a bunch of and some some of these are like a little bit out of favor but there's like you know there's the chinese yahoo clone there's the chinese twitter clone there's the chinese um google clone is baidu and um They've diverged some from where they originally were, as like Baidu, Baidu is doing slightly different things than Google now. But there, there's the Chinese Quora clone. Like, what the hell? Um, <laughs> but they ended up having a significant amount of like freedom to expand and develop because of this like regulatory structure of the of the of the firewall. I think, and I think that's like at least half of the reason why they. Why, why the Chinese state is so um, keen on, you know, part of it is information management, but part of it is, um, is this like really savvy uh, economic move, I think. Yeah, like the stuff around like internet platforms and like the politics of that is both really fascinating and also really underdeveloped. What do you mean? Well, as in, not, I guess, no, not underdeveloped, because there are like good people who are writing on this and like people have been sort of thinking about these sort of things for ages. But um, in terms of like, I guess more in terms of like the general discourse, it seems like, you know, I don't know, like I've seen, you know, like articles 
on like Jacobin being like, oh, we should nationalize Twitter. You, you know, you just, yeah. Um, that, that- <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, right? Like the US is going to nationalize the discourse for everybody. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. I, that might not actually be a real thing. But like that, that's sort of like the vibe I get from some people. Like I have heard like, you know, like socialists who are like fairly sharp about other things be like, yeah, you know, like we should just give control of like the internet commons to like a single country. And I'm like, oh God, you don't understand. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. I just think that's like a particularly, at least from my, like I've seen that also and, you know, more or less American media sphere. And I think that's just like a, a bit of particularly American chauvinism where people pretend that the rest of the world doesn't exist and like don't have to think about it and are, you know, not thinking about the fact that like discourse is taking place on Facebook in, you know, Korean and Japanese and whatever, Chinese in, 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 in Taiwan. Yeah, I think um, I should really try and find someone who like, you know, has sort of tried to analyze social changes just in terms of like self-perception brought about by the internet. Like I've seen some people say that um, on one hand, it's actually sort of led to a resurgence in nationalism just because like it's a way for people to have an identity in this like very sort of fluid and dynamic space. But on the other hand, you know, like there's also Mm. internationalism and like a sort of permanability of like national boundaries it's not like you know we're all becoming one world and like this is definitely true for me like my like identity is not like i like i never i never really felt comfortable identifying as an australian but that's like definitely the case since like i started making all these like internet friends like a in the last couple of years um you know like i have people in like america and europe who like i'm pretty sure if i like rocked up and was like hey could like you know i spend like a night on your couch or whatever i'm pretty sure like a lot of people would say yes um and so like you know yeah absolutely yeah. um and I, I i think i think these sort of things you know like it's not going to be like a linear progression to you know some sort of enlightened utopia but like I think these sort of like habits and default assumptions, I think, especially when like large portions of the population start adopting them, I think like that can really lead to significant shifts. And um, I I haven't really seen anyone talking about it. And I'd really like to find someone who uh, is knowledgeable about these sort of things and talk to them. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. A, a lot of it, like you, it's interesting because you can have, weird situations where there's a, where you can have like, like, I don't know. I, I, I think about like, we have a lot of nostalgia. I personally have a lot of nostalgia for the sort of international solidarity structures that existed in the early 20th century. And like, that was a period where there was a lot of international migration and, you know, a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the American anarchists were actually Italians or, or, or from other, from all kinds of other places and were, some were sent back, et cetera. And there's like, actually, so the, 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 this is just a bit, this is just like a trivia thing, but this is like the, the, the central core of my nostalgia is that like in the, the, the there's a famous Chinese author, Ba Jin, who's kind of the father of the modern Chinese novel to some extent, um, wrote this very famous trilogy that was about the experience of youth in the May 4th movement, which is this, he was kind of part of but it was a sort of like anti-traditional like modernizing youth student movement that kind of in in a lot of ways laid the seeds for the later both the nationalists and the communists a few decades few decades later um but so bajin is this guy who came up in the may 4th movement in china was read it was wealthy and elite enough, I guess, to be educated and read not, well, read at all, actually, but then also read other languages. And there's all of this stuff. He was an anarchist, and he had correspondence with Emma Goldman in Esperanto, I think, that they were writing in Esperanto. But like, there's like, you know, Ba Jin, one of the most famous Chinese novelists, has like correspondence with Emma Goldman writes in Chinese for all of these like kind of like movement 
uh, pamphlets, all of the like a uh, a eulogy for the Haymarket martyrs and stuff. Like I think a bunch of that we have lost. I talked to a Korean friend who was in a bunch of anarchist groups when she was in college. And she was like, oh, yeah, all my friends learned Esperanto because that was like what we had to, that was like the, the, the right anarchist thing to do was to learn the international language. And I was like, man, I, you know, if only. But then on the other hand, like to, to sort of like counter the nostalgia is the Hong Kong movement in 2019, you have this idea of like all of these people talk about like being on the front line of the Hong Kong movement. And then suddenly all like that tactic just reappears everywhere and like, mm. and it transitions, Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's structured differently. Like the be water thing that they were doing was different from what they were doing in Chile, but like some of the slogans were, were, were transported over and translated from, um, from Cantonese into Spanish. And like, I don't know, there's all, there's all of this stuff like memes, basically protest memes that can travel very rapidly and very far. And I, and I, and I think that that, you know, it's not the same thing as everybody speaking Esperanto and writing letters and putting them on steamships to cross the Pacific or something, which is amazing. I want more of that, but yes, yes. what we have now is also not, is, is also not bad. Like just the way that, yeah, the way that the image of like a bunch of people, with shields putting out tear gas suddenly became pe- people with shields putting out tear gas like <laughs> all over in this like current sort of cycle of insurrection that's that's happening um yeah and i have a lot i have a lot of hope about that like and the internet as a route for that yeah i think there's like you know well it is very sort of i don't know like the image of you know like people coming together with like this language that's supposed to be like universal and like writing each other letters or like you know taking boat trips well that's all you know it's it's like very fine and also aesthetically it also has something to it i think that that was probably the reserve of like a very very few people could actually like do that sort of thing and i think what we've got now is certainly in many ways certainly a lot cruder but um it's it's far more democratic in that it's far more accessible yeah absolutely and and and, you know it's not just like it's not just like people sharing protest memes like um right there was this article i can't remember what it's called but i'm including the show notes uh by the guardian that was like talking about protest tactics going viral basically and um like one thing they noted was like yeah people are sharing memes and stuff but they're also you know putting together like um guides for how to do things and how to mix things and you know they're sharing that or like videos for how to you know right. like diffuse tear gas or whatever uh and that's crossing between different national struggles and um yeah i think i think i think another aspect of this that isn't emphasized but is like really important is that what the internet allows is for um people in other countries to directly support those struggling you know like obviously you know you can like give people money but like um ah there was um some like leaking group who like leaked a bunch of military stuff i think from myanmar myanmar or whatever Mm -hmm. again i will put this in the notes but like people who are like remote to a conflict can still participate by like hacking from afar or walking people through like doing i don't know like medical first aid or something right and i i I think like this sort of thing really the past decade it's like really just been like the first wave of this yeah there is always like the possibility that like the internet gets nationalized and balkanized which would be awful but um you know there are there are countermeasures to that so that's not like you know that's like another side of struggle but um, I just think that like being able to remotely assist right. in struggle overseas, I think that's like a really, really big deal. And I think, again, it's something that like certain people have written about, but like it's something that could stand, it's something that could like be considerably more emphasized. Yeah. And even beyond like some of the stuff that takes intense technical skill like hacking. I'm just thinking back to from 2019, 2020, 
I know like in Hong Kong, a lot of what happened was like, in addition to all of the people who were on the streets, who all had like a bunch of, you know, sort of like very developed, very rapidly iterated tactical responses to riot police and stuff. There were also like, there were all of these additional roles that people were able to play. And so there were a bunch of people doing like scouting work, but not actually being involved on like the front lines of anything. And then there were also a ton of people who would be directly involved just by like watching live streams and listening to police scanners oh, yeah. and um, like collating information. Yeah. This is, I went to a sort of sharing event where people were talking about the ways that this happened. And like, it was actually very, very structured and organized by the sort of height of the height of the uprising where there were all of these like telegram groups where scout people would report police movements and then like other people who were not on the street would be doing this work of like uh, watching live streams and like confirming and yeah. creating these like live updated maps of like where cops are, what's blocked off, um, where escape routes are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is like a huge part of why the people who were on the street were able to outmaneuver the cops and not, yeah. not get kettled basically. And like a bunch of people who were doing that work, like you didn't have to be local to do that work. Mm, yeah. You were sitting in your apartment, like watching live streams and aggregating information from like a bunch of group chats, basically. I wasn't part of this, but like similar stuff was happening around the sort of George Floyd Black Lives Matter organizing in the US. I it looked less structured, but there were I was in China at the time and would wake up because it's like a 12 hour time dis- difference more or less so i'd wake up in the morning right around when all of the riots were popping off and just like stare at my phone for five hours just like watching people you know live tweeting police scanners and sharing all of that info and like that stuff is you know direct material aid to people on the ground even when you can't be on the ground maybe you're in a different city whatever yeah and it's still it's skilled it's like a skilled a skilled way to do it but it's not like hacking or some kind of like unattainable thing yeah yeah, yeah. i mean like y- you know about like bellingcat right mm-hmm. yeah yeah i was gonna say, i was gonna i was gonna say them as an as another example but i think all of, all the tankies say they're like they're definitely cia or something right i don't know my opinion of bellingcat is like sort of like WikiLeaks in that I think there is a pretty good case to be made that they do have ties to government organizations and that might compromise their work but that's like completely orthogonal to the actual model that they do yeah yeah I think it's going to be really interesting to see I mean I'm hopeful on this front that there is more things that used to be like Basically, that there's just like a, an overall reduced capital cost of almost everything over the next you know couple of decades. Whether it's because that I mean that's kind of that's kind of the thing is that like intelligence was hard and required mm. vast amounts of yep. you know power and money. Yes, yep. I mean this is why the CIA was trafficking all that coke in the first place, right? But like. Uh, I don't know. That's flippant. I don't actually know that much about that history, but, but you know, like doing intelligence is hard, is hard and expensive and co- has a pretty high cost. Having an air force is really hard and expensive and has a high cost. But like you know, hopefully we can all learn how to use drones to make that not so yeah not so effective yeah. anymore, right? And the, the part of that, like I don't know, some of the like three D printing stuff is also in this area. But like, and, and I, I, th- I think a lot of it, you have to actually look at it really specifically to figure out if it's going to work or not. Like, I am a little bit skeptical that, like, I, I tend to be kind of agno- agnostic. Like, I don't consider myself a Marxist, and I don't consider myself a neutralist or a, like market anarchist or anything. Because I'm kind of just like, I don't really care. I just want less power in the world overall, but yeah, like in the same way that I'm kind of like kind of accept some Mar- Marxist ideas around cost of reproduction of labor ends up determining wages, right? Would I, I don't think I'm smart enough to have a like strong take on the labor theory of value and whether or not it's like absolutely correct. But like 
you know, it seems true to me that people who move from different places where the cost of living is lower, you can pay them less money um, to raise their kids and stuff. Uh, but in this, in, in, in the same way, I'm like, yeah, it's, it seems absolutely correct that decentralizing things will reduce the ability of, of states and other, other, other forms of centralized power to exercise control and that, and that that's good. But it also seems like you probably have to look at, I don't know, like degrees of decentralization, like what that actually looks like on the ground and yep. what kinds of actual technologies are being used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. I think that what we're seeing with technological progress, it's more like in certain spaces, you won't need the sort of like large scale capital intensive bureaucratic hierarchies. And then from those from those spaces, you can then use that to like try and have the same sort of dynamics play out in other spaces and yeah. like it's a fluid terrain that's like always going to be contested uh as opposed to just being like well you know like historical materialism shows that the proletariat will inevitably rise up so <laughs> don't worry about it mate right i think i think that's a really good place to end it yeah you want to spruik anything well i might as well attach my twitter even though my name's on this you can follow me at no citizens again i just want to plug going back to the discussion around thinking around about china i think it's important for people to have a good sense of what's going on unfortunately the structure of you know like it's weird because a lot of the academic work that's being put out around china exists in like this international relations framework that is fundamentally about like us imperial interest in a direct mil- like kind of clash of civilizations you weird way not all of it there's a bunch of people working in that space who are really good some of whom are my friends but like i think for someone coming from the outside trying to understand things like looking at the academic literature isn't always all that helpful i mean it is helpful it's better than reading tankies but you have to like think about what you're what you're actually reading and where it's coming from i personally like chuang gongchao uh, the Made in China people, aside from reading through a bunch of academic articles, I think th- th- those are some of the better places to get a sense of of the terrain. Um, I'm sure there are a ton more that I would like to plug, but I'm forgetting right now. Oh, well, just like you know, message me them, and I'll include them in the show notes. Yeah, I'll put I'll put the, I'll put things in this in the show notes. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you. It was interesting to talk. <laughs>